Thank you very much, and hi everyone. <laughs> well, uh, applause before I even get started. That's that's new. Okay, so the quantum computers are coming. So, my name is Alastair Collinson. I'm a software senior software developer for Zenacore Technologies, and blah blah blah. You probably don't care about any of that, do you? Well, here's one thing about me that you should care about, and that's I'm a nerd. And while I am a nerd, one thing I'm not is a physicist. Uh, the last time I had any formal education in physics was over a decade ago, and uh, that wasn't very thorough. And yet I'm here to talk about quantum computers today. And that quantum part of quantum computers really sounds like physics, doesn't it? Well, the thing is, quantum computers are getting to a point where you don't have to be a genius physicist any longer to get into the subject. Being a nerd is quite sufficient. Now, looking at you, there are several alternative talks you could be uh, listening to right now at this moment, yet you're sitting here in a talk about quantum computers, so chances are that you two might be nerds. So that's really, really good, and let's get started. Quantum computers, let's start with the easy part. What's a computer? Well, here's one computer, rather, Older than what you're probably used to, this is a replica of the Tsuza Z3. Um, some people may argue this was the first computer there was. It was certainly the first electronic, digital, programmable computer. Digital binary, in fact. And binary is a really, really important point because probably every computer you've used up to this point will have been binary. There have been a few non-binary computers throughout history, but they are extremely rare. And when we think binary, we normally think about zeros and ones, but strictly speaking, that's not correct, is it? Basically, what we need are two distinct states. And as far as we are concerned, those could be a green circle and a red triangle. They just have to be distinct. Now, modern computers work with transistors and, well, not with those transistors, they look a bit more like this. But basically how a transistor works is that you have two inputs and under certain conditions, if the inputs are right, th they will give an output. If the conditions are not right, they won't. won't. Two distinct conditions. And that's great for many, many problems. I mean, we've been able to solve so much with this kind of technology. We just saw in the keynote how much uh, growth there has been in the IT industry or through the IT industry in the last couple of decades. But there are problems that quantum computers are simply, uh, that, that by, um, classical computers, I mean, are simply not very well versed to solve. So I'm going to show you that the nerds in the audience might be a bit shocked by nature. <laughs> nature poses some really, really hard problems. I mean, in this image, where do we have forest? Let's zoom in a bit. So that part here, that's nature. Uh, that, that's, well, it's all nature. That's a forest. And here, that's not forest. That's grassland. But what about here? I mean, there clearly are some trees there, right? But most of it is grass. So do we call it forest, don't we? We as humans have to decide. We have to draw an arbitrary line so and so many trees per square kilometer means it's forest or something like that. And by deciding we lose information because we have to either say this is grassland or this is forest. Or maybe we introduce a third category, but there will always be lines we have to draw. And these kinds of problems are really, really difficult for classical computers to handle. So computers out of the way, that was the easy part, quantum. Well, quantum, of course, relates to quantum physics and quantum mechanics. And that was introduced by Niels Bohr here and Werner Karl Heisenberg in the 1920s. They worked together in Copenhagen and came up with both the basics of quantum mechanics and the so-called Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. I'm going to get into that really quickly. If there are any physicists in the room, this is a really, really strong simplification. Please don't hit me. So 
Let's uh, take an example. You have an atom. Actually, we don't care about the whole atom. We just care about the nucleus. And assuming that this atom, this element, is radioactive, it at some point will decay. And that looks a bit like this. Part of the nucleus splits off. Um, in this case, that would be an alpha particle, which uh, is then our radiation. And what's left is a smaller nucleus, and therefore a smaller atom. Now, if you have one of these atoms and you wait for a certain period of time, there are two states that you could imagine you will measure. Either, well, nothing's happened, it hasn't decayed, or it has decayed. That's pretty simple. But according to the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, you can also have this, where you have both states at the same time. That is until you measure. And don't get me wrong, I drew measuring as eyes here. It has nothing to do with human consciousness. Measuring just means that the system is required to have a state. You can have quantum physics without humans altogether. I mean, nobody to think about it, but it's, it's totally unrelated. Um, but still, this is a weird thing. How can, be something, uh, how can something be in two seemingly contradictory states at the same time? And one person who uh, thought this was odd was this guy here, Schrodinger. So Schrodinger came up with an example explaining why this was rather counterintuitive. And that's, of course, the famous thought experiment of Schrodinger's cat. So Schrodinger's cat. Let's go through that experiment really quickly. You have the cat, and you put the cat into a box. In this box, you also have a few other things, namely a radioactive source, an isotope of some kind. Now, this is basically what we saw with our radioactive atom earlier. But this is, well, probably there are several atoms in there. I mean, it's hard to get just one. And it's chosen in such a fashion that if you wait for one hour, the chance that any of it will have had decayed is 50-50. Okay? So, we have that isotope. What else? We have a bottle of gaseous cyanide. Now, as long as it's in the bottle, that's absolutely fine. But cyanide is really poisonous. So, um, yeah, we want, don't want that to get out, do we? And then we have this weird contraption. This is a Geiger counter with a hammer attached. And now, if the Geiger counter should measure any radiation, what happens? <laughs> Dead cat. So, again, um, we wait for one hour, and there are two states that we could measure. You know, either the radioactive isotope has not decayed and everything's fine, or, well, dead cat. According to the Copenhagen interpretation, we could have both of those at the same time, overlapping. How can anything be dead and alive at the same time? I don't think Schrodinger was thinking zombie cats here, but it is a weird problem. Now, Schrodinger didn't think that quantum mechanics was crap altogether. He just thought the interpretation was nonsense. And so he came up with his own interpretation, which became known as the many worlds theory. Now, a quick disclaimer before I continue with the many worlds theory. For us, the many worlds theory is a model, a way of thinking about something. And models can inherently be wrong in many, many ways as long as they are wrong in ways that we simply don't care about. That's fine. And many physicists believe that the many worlds interpretation is wrong, that actually the Copenhagen interpretation is the way to go. But still, for us, the many worlds interpretation, the many worlds theory, is a way that we can think about these kinds of problems. And that's useful. So how does this many worlds theory work? Well, first of all, we take the entire universe. And I know this is just a galaxy. I couldn't find a picture of the universe. But um, <laughs> we take the whole universe, everything in it, including, of course, our cat. And then one of these quantum events happens. The outcome is not a zombie cat in this case, but instead, and 
I really love how physicists come up with these simple solutions, the university is carbon copied. That is except for the outcome of that one quantum event. So we have two universes now which are absolutely identical except for the outcome of that radioactive event, that quantum event, which means in one the cat is alive, in the other it's dead. And of course this can be repeated many times. So after another quantum event we may have four universes and this goes on and on. Uh, you get the picture. One thing you may see here that may seem a bit odd is that we have rather many dead cats. And this is a limitation not of quantum physics, but of biology. Because, you know, if you have a dead cat and you add more poison, you do not get a live cat. But luckily, cats are not quantum computers. And here we finally are. So this here is a representation of a qubit, a quantum bit. This specific representation is called a Bloch sphere. And so what can we have in a qubit? Well, we can have a zero state, just like we know from, from our classical bits. We can also have a one state, also nothing new. But then we can also have something like this, which is neither zero nor one, but somewhere on the sphere. And how do we get there? Well, there are certain quantum gates that we can use on qubits. So one gate that's really useful and very interesting is the Hadamard gate. The Hadamard gate basically imagines that in this sphere we have an imaginary axis halfway between the x and the z axis, and we just spin our vector around that axis. This here, this state, is quantum superposition. This is being dead and alive at the same time. Because if we were to measure this qubit at this point in time, we would get 0 and 1, each with 50% probability. And if we repeat this a thousand times, for example, you will get around 500 times 0 and 500 times 1. And it's, it's probability, so the uh, results won't be exact. That's how probability works, but they'll be close. Okay, so superposition. Understood. A rather simpler gate is the X gate. So the X gate takes our, uh, our value and it just spins it around the X axis. Now, if it spins it around the X axis, and if we would apply it again, it would go back to zero. That means it's basically a not operator that we know from classical computing, right? A not gate. So that's easy to understand and relatively easy to use, at least up till now. It gets a bit more exciting when we have the conditional not, the C not gate. So this is a combination of an X and a condition. And so we have two qubits here. One of them is the, uh, the control gate and one of them is the target gate. The control gate here is in position zero. And if we apply the C naught, then, well, nothing happens because the condition wasn't met. If we have our control Q gate in position one and apply our C naught, then the other one will be flipped. So far, so easy, but now, we also have superposition states. So what happens if our control qubit is in superposition and we apply the C naught? We get something a bit like this. And suddenly we have two arrows there. Basically what we have is closer to this here. These two qubits are now linked. Either both will be zero or both will be one. You don't get a one is uh, one value and the other is the different value in this case. They're both the same, or if they started out opposite, they are both opposite, but always opposite. So this allows us to actually combine qubits, and that's the basis for uh, any kind of computation, to be able to combine values of various uh, subvalues. 
basically what we have here is what we had with the isotope and the cat. Both are in the same kind of state. This is what's called quantum entanglement, what Einstein once referred to as spooky action at a distance. And it will remain in a, a uh, superposition state as long as nobody measures it. Or it, no, uh, no measurement is made, I should say. As, as I said, um, no consciousness is required. So we have here several states at the same time that we can work with. Now, there are many gates you could use on quantum computers and qubits. I've shown you the Hadamard gate and the CNOT gate. I've showed you one of the three Pauli gates. The other two, Y and Z, basically do the same thing, just spinning around different axes. There's also the identity gate, which I didn't show you because it's really boring. It just takes a, uh, a qubit and does nothing. There are phase gates, for example, which do really funky things that can be really useful. I'm not going to get into them now because that would go too far. And there are many, many other gates that you could imagine and that, in some cases, you can use. So, okay, fine. That doesn't seem too hard to simulate, right? I mean, why go to the trouble of trying to build these weird things if we can just simulate them? And I'd like to go back to a previous slide here. Remember this slide here? So in theory, when I press the button here, there should be a smooth transition to the gravestones for all of those dead cats. Let's see, press. Yeah, that was not smooth. Would anyone argue that it was smooth? My computer is struggling with PowerPoint. This here, as soon as the slides actually continue, there we go. This here is Google's Bristlecone quantum computer. It's the largest uh, quantum computer known to the public, at least, to date. Probably places like the NSA are working on this kind of stuff as well, and not publishing the results. This is the largest one we know about. And as I said, it has 72 qubits. Now, about a month ago, uh, scientists from Alibaba, the huge Chinese internet corporation, published a paper where they simulated quantum computers, large quantum computers, on the Alibaba cloud. And Google's computer would, I believe, fit in somewhere about here. And what did they need for that? Well, they used 131,072 processors and one petabyte of memory. Those numbers sound large, but what do they mean? Well, if you have 1, uh, 131,072 processors, each with approximately this size, as far as I can tell, that is the size uh, of the processors they used, and you just lay them out one after each other with the long sides, you get about 10 kilometers of processors. Considering that normal walking speeds are four to 10 kilometers per hour, it would take you about two hours to walk by the row of processors. That's a lot of processors. And what about the memory? So I said it was a petabyte of memory. That's a thousand terabytes. That's a million gigabytes. That's 10 to the 15 bytes. A study I found said that one human being has approximately 3.72 to the uh, times 10 to the 13 cells. So 10 to the 15 cells is as ma many as not in one human, not in two human. Now we have to have about 27 people. There we go, 27 people. And count all of their bodily cells to get to approximately 10 to the 15. That's a lot of memory we need. Why do we want to do it in the first place? I mean, yeah, it's an interesting academic exercise, but why do we need it? And there are quite a few use cases. I have collected a few here. One of them, and that's the one you've probably heard of if you've heard anything about quantum computers in, uh, in, in, uh, uh, well, in the media, encryption. So quantum computers can potentially break encryption. And that's because most modern encryption algorithms are based on 
the factorization of large numbers, multiplying one huge primary number with another huge primary number gives you a third huge number, much, much huger and much, much larger. And getting back to the original numbers is a really expensive thing to do. Quantum computers are relatively good at that kind of task. Um, so that's going to be a problem as soon as we get to quantum computers with enough qubits. Um, various companies are using, uh, are trying out quantum computers for engineering tasks, including Volkswagen, with the help of Google. Um, you can simulate chemical processes with quantum computers because, I mean, chemistry is based on physical uh, properties. It's based on quantum physics, if you get down to it. And so using a quantum computer to qu simulate quantum processes, that makes life easier. Um, AI is a pretty big field that can benefit from quantum computers. And I'll get back to that, uh, to both of those actually, a bit later. Um, weather prediction. I mean, weather prediction has gotten much, much better in the last couple of years, but it's still not perfect because weather systems are really, really complex. And quantum computers could probably help there. Uh, financial fraud detection, human behavior, I mean, if you're talking about weather being complex, human behavior is awful. Um, and fraud detection is a really, really complicated problem that many, many companies are earning a lot of money with trying to out-detect their competitors. And I mean, it, it works fairly good, but uh, fairly well, but there's room for improvement. NASA is using quantum computers for uh, designing various things that have to do with space travels and space exploration. And to jump on the hype train just a little bit, yeah, Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency. That crypto part is basically what we were speaking about when I, uh, I talked about encryption. For the moment, you're, well, I wouldn't say safe with Bitcoin because it's Bitcoin, but as safe as you're going to get with Bitcoin. But as soon as we have quantum computers powerful enough to do the mining for you, they'll be worthless in no time at all, probably. So you're safe for the moment, as safe as you can be with Bitcoin, but uh, a few years hence, we'll see. So all of these use cases are interesting, but most people working in the field right now are from the academic or scientific uh, uh, area. And that's partially why we in the quantum computing community need people like you to join, people who work in industry, who have completely different use cases in many cases than uh, those working in science. And well, okay, so we need you. Why do you need us? Um, well, one thing is, I mean, job security is always a good thing. There was recently a quantum computing job fair, the first one ever, as far as I know, held in uh, Bristol in the UK. But also, possibly much more immediate. This here is a quote from a fellow speaker, Venkat, and he's not the first one to say it, but I think he put it very well. Learning something new will help you think in different ways and it will help you solve problems more efficiently because you have a broader spectrum of knowledge. So, okay, let's just assume for the moment that you've accepted that this may be something interesting how do you actually get started? And there are several possibilities, and I've, I'm going to show the, uh, the ones that I deem most important. So first one here is the IBM Quantum Experience. The IBM Quantum Experience is basically quantum computers in the cloud. So IBM has built several quantum computers by now, and they look a bit like this. The, actually, this part here, that's not the quantum computer, that's the cryostat, basically a huge freezer. The quantum computer itself looks a bit like this. This specifically is a seven qubit quantum computer. And like most of the most successful quantum computers at the moment, it's 
built using a superconducting technology, which means it has to be cooled down as close to absolute zero as you can get. And I mean, those, those cryostats do get really cold. It's, it's uh, millikelvins. It's colder than in outer space. That's, of course, still a hurdle for many things. I mean, you can't have a cryostat in your laptop. But um, there are other technologies that don't require that and that hopefully will become uh, more relevant in the next couple of years. Nevertheless, you can't have a quantum computer at home, but IBM has a few and they have the quantum experience. That's, it's basically a website you can use and a service. And if you register there, what you'll see where you'll spend a lot of your time is this view. This is the quantum composer. Now at the top we have some information about the quantum computers they are currently offering to use. And at the bottom here, this is the quantum score, named so because it looks like you have musical notes in there, but you don't. Instead, you write your quantum algorithms in there. To the side here we have quantum gates, and those are uh, among others, the ones we saw earlier. So you have your Hadamard gate with the H, you have the X gate, you have the C0 gate, which is that round one with a plus symbol in the middle. And you can build quantum computers in this visual editor. So let's do that. Let's build a quantum algorithm and we'll go with something we already know, Schrodinger's cat. So for the Schrodinger's cat algorithm, what do we need? Well, the cat, obviously, we need the radioactive isotope, we need the Geiger counter, and we need the poison. And all of those have to be linked up sequentially. So building that as a quantum algorithm would look a bit like this. We have our, uh, our isotope, which is in superposition. So we use an, a Hadamard gate for that. And then we link up the other ones sequentially using C0 gates. And that's pretty simple. And Looking into the box is this pink gate here, the measurement gate. Actually, let's not just measure that one uh, qubit because each line represents a qubit here. Let's measure all of the qubits that we're working on. And if we run this algorithm, again, on a real quantum computer that IBM is uh, providing for us, we get something like this as a result. And well, how does, how does this work? How do you interpret it? Here, this is the result where at the bottom you see only zeros. That means nothing happened. Zero is the ground state. Here is the situation where everything happened. The isotope decayed, everything else happened, the cat's dead. You see that with four ones there. The first digit we can ignore, that's the qubit we didn't measure. But then we have that. And I, I ran the experiment, I think it was a thousand times or a thousand twenty-four times, something like that. Um, we got the Results we were expecting with about 30% probability each. But then we have all of those, and those, well, they're mistakes. They're measurement errors. Even though uh, the quantum computers are cooled down to such extremely low temperatures, and a lot of ingenuity goes into building them, we are in the early days of actually building physical quantum computers. And error rates are getting a bit better, but Quantum error correction is still a huge, huge topic in the field. It is going to get better. There are many, many uh, things in the works that will improve the situation here. But if you work with quantum computers, expect errors to happen. We're still not at the point where you can have anything even closely reliable to what we have with classical computers today. And even they make mistakes. It's just re very rare nowadays. Okay, so that's the quantum experience. Next up, the Microsoft Quantum Development Kit. Now, this looks much more like code that we are used to than what we just saw. Um, the Quantum Development Kit from Microsoft comes with a language they call Q Sharp. <laughs> Microsoft. Um, and Q Sharp, I've, I've written our algorithm in Q Sharp here. And, um, don't worry, most of it is blurred out. That's not your eyes. So building our algorithm here looks fairly simple. We have here our Hadamard gate, which we apply to the isotope. And then we link that up to the other qubits via C0 gates. And that's basically our algorithm. Four lines. 
Now, we also want to have something that represents the state of the cat. So we have a mutable variable here. By default, in Qsharp, everything is immutable. And we have here the looking into the box part. So checking, is our cat dead or alive at this point? And when, then we return our result at the end of the function, or the, the operation in uh, Q sharp speak. And uh, other than that, we have some, well, basically boilerplate code here. So here we determine we want to use four qubits. Oh, yeah, OK, that, that's not so much boilerplate. And here we give the qubits names, because even in quantum computing, naming is really important. Q0 is not a good name, or qubit 0 is not a good name to work with. So give the child a name. And then we have to initialize everything to 0. The quantum experience did this for us. In uh, the quantum development kit from Microsoft, we have to initialize them to 0 ourselves. And we have to clean up after ourselves, set them, in them to 0 once again. This is to make sure that um, it's basically compatible with any kind of quantum computer we may want to run this on. And what happens then is I mean, Q sharp reminds you, it possibly reminds you of something. It's built into the .NET platform. So here we have a C sharp program. We're in the CNET track here, any, uh, in the .NET track here anyway, so very fitting. And basically here we say we want to use a quantum simulator in this case. The, uh, the quantum development kit does come with a simulator, and that's fine for small problems. Four qubits is no problem at all. Um, but you could have something else implementing that interface. There is a project that's working on uh, integrating the quantum experience with Q Sharp, and then you could use the same code, just replace quantum simulator here with whatever the quantum experience version is, and you're all set. Here we run the experiment. So from our C sharp code, we call our Q sharp code with the quantum computer we determined, and then we decide what to do with the result. In this case, print out Schrodinger's cat is alive or dead. So that's, that's uh, quite nice. It's not the only way if you want to go with something closer to code than what we saw previously, however. So the next project I want to introduce really shortly is Rigetti Forest. Rigetti is a quantum computing startup because, of course, there are quantum computing startups. And they introduced their project called Forest, which is a quantum computing API for the cloud. So very similar in concept to what we saw with the IBM quantum experience. It doesn't have the, uh, the graphical IDE, as we saw in the composer, but it does offer some really interesting things. They have, I believe currently, the, the largest computer you can use is actually an 8-qubit quantum computer. They had a 19-qubit uh, quantum computer, but that was too error-prone for them, so they, I think they've switched that off. But a larger one is certainly coming. And this is... Well, uh, the, the Rigetti Forest project consists of two parts, basically. First of all, you have a language called Quill, which is for describing your quantum algorithms. So same algorithm as before. We have our Hadamard gate for the isotope. We have our three C0 gates. We measure all of it absolutely fine and very short and concise. And you can then read this in with a Python program and send it to their quantum computer or a quantum simulator they're offering. Alternatively, the Python SDK they often offer also allows you to write your code directly in Python. So this here is the same algorithm we just saw. It looks nearly identical. The syntax is slightly different, but it's, it's very, very close. And this will run my code on a quantum computer offered by them. And this is really, uh, really concise. Um, I, I do actually really like the syntax used by Rigetti Forest, um, even though I'm not very familiar with Python. Talking about Python, there's one last project I want to introduce to you. So I've titled this KISSKIT Aqua, and it starts a bit earlier. KISSKIT 
has been around for quite a while. This is actually the Python SDK for the quantum experience, which we saw earlier from IBM. And it, uh, similarly to uh, Rigetti Forest, allows you to access their, uh, their quantum computers through a Python SDK. And all, they also have their own quantum comp uh, computing programming language called Quasm. Um, and you can read in Quasm files and send them through Python and so on and so forth. That's not too different from what we saw with Frigetti, but pretty much exactly a week ago, this happened. They announced Qiskit Aqua, which is a library for Qiskit, which allows you to uh, uh, work on certain problems even without too much quantum computing knowledge. They have parts uh, of their library specifically for chemical problems, specifically simulating um, uh, quantum chemistry and measuring things there. They have specific uh, parts of the library for AI applications. And you can use those without knowing too much about quantum computing to build, for example, classification uh, algorithms fairly easily at least if you know your way around AI. And they also have uh, part of the library they call the optimization part. And that allows you to tackle certain computational problems. For example, uh, you can work on partition, uh, on the partition problem, which is NP-hard. And have, basically, you have one set of numbers, and you want to divide it into two distinct balanced sets of numbers. And quantum computers can do that. Now, I, I can't tell you what the runtime of that would be and how it compares to the best uh, classical computer runtimes. I haven't had enough time to look into that because, as I said, this is a week old. And I do have other things to do. But um, it's really impressive that you can now start working on that kind of stuff without knowing about quantum computers that much. Now, you do still have to have knowledge in the domain you're working in. I looked into the chemistry part and I was lost pretty quickly because I have no idea what most of it meant because I don't know uh, that uh, chemistry at that kind of level. But I didn't have to know any quantum computing basically to understand, or I didn't have to know much quantum computing to understand some other parts. So you don't necessarily have to be a quantum computing expert to use those things. Now, the library is still very, very limited. Th they have something like, uh, I think it's around about 10 algorithms that they offer out of the box that you can use. And those are specific to those three kinds of problems, which, again, are fairly academic. The AI stuff is still very, very primitive compared to what most AI systems nowadays can do. So we do need people to improve on that. And we do need to have a basic understanding of what kinds of problems you could use quantum computing algorithms on. When do you want to use quantum computing? So that's why, that's basically the how. So just to recap, if you want to get started with quantum computing. If I've convinced you that this is a really interesting subject that uh, may be interesting to you, um, you can register at the Quantum Experience from IBM. By the way, I'll be, uh, I'll be tweeting out the slides probably tomorrow morning. And if you are not on Twitter, uh, you can always just send me an email. My email address will be shown at the end. Um, and I'll, I'll just send you the slides. So you don't have to note the, uh, the URLs. So you can use the quantum experience. Linked to that, of course, you can use Qiskit and Qiskit uh, Aqua. Um, all of this is free. You can use the Microsoft Quantum Development Kit available for, uh, for all of the major operating systems, Windows, Mac, and Linux. Also completely for free. You can sign up to Rigetti Forest. Again, totally free. And if you think, well, I'd la like to start in a more playful manner, there's a game called Hello Quantum written 
in this case with uh, Qiskit, so for the IBM Quantum Experience, which allows you to explore quantum computing pro problems in a playful way. And it, it looks a bit like this. Um, this is open source on GitHub, and the link I've written down there is to an online Python interpreter which loads the game so you can play online. It also links to the, the GitHub repository, so if you want to run it locally, you can. This is a screenshot of me running it locally, no problem at all. If you prefer somewhat more advanced graphics, because I mean, this is, you know, it's ASCII art, it's a bit limited. Um, and if you have an iPhone or iPad, there's also this, which is the same game, but for iOS. And you can get that in the App Store for free. There's not, as far as I'm informed, yet an Android version that is coming, but well, it's still in the works. If you have problems with any of these things, well, apart from maybe the game, there's also a quantum stack exchange, literally Stack Overflow for quantum computing. And you can register there again, totally for free. And I really recommend that you look into some or maybe even all of those uh, resources because it's a fascinating field. It's not easy, I'll admit that, but it's really fascinating. It's a lot of fun. I recommend you try it out. So thank you very much and we have some time for questions.